Say when. One. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, welcome everyone to another Wasabi Research Club meeting. Today we're talking about a 2006 paper called Anonymity Loves Company, uh, Usability and the Network Effects. Uh, this paper is by uh, Dingledine and Matthewson. Um, and you can find all the papers that we read uh, on our website. The link is just below on our GitHub, excuse me. Just to remind everyone where we are in the um, last few weeks, we were talking about CoinShuffle++ and Cash Fusion. Um, and I, I've decided to call this meeting, you know, sort of principles in privacy or perhaps principles in privacy in anonymity networks, because I think it's very appropriate to, to what we're doing. Uh, and next week's um, research club meeting will be decided by the end of this meeting. You can find everything on the GitHub. Just a reminder, two weeks ago uh, and last week, we talked about uh, cash fusion talked about doing coin joins with arbitrary numbers of inputs and outputs, uh, where users all submit inputs, outputs, and blanks. And through the magic of homomorphic encryption, uh, homomorphic uh, Peter, uh, Pedersen commitments, um, we can guarantee that no one is getting more money than they put in. And we have all users verifying other users to make sure that no one cheated. Uh, last week, we asked the question, is this really private? Is it secure? Can someone break this uh, method of obfuscating inputs and outputs? And uh, there was a claim being made in our discussion that due to the bell number and the subset sum problem, you are secure uh, given enough users who possess a large enough set of inputs and outputs within a particular range of values. Um, because uh, the bell number is quite large in, in those cases and the knapsack problem is computationally difficult to solve. Um, please see videos on YouTube for uh, interesting debate that ensued after uh, uh, this discussion. So, uh, yes. So the question posed by this paper that we're reading today is how should we think about building using privacy tools in anonymity networks? When I say anonymity networks, I mean something like Tor or JAP or MixMinion, MixMaster, or in our, what we care about uh, in these calls is CoinJoin. Um, anonymity network relies on getting anonymity from hiding uh, among other users. And from this idea, we get uh, the anonymity set, which is the concept that you are as anonymous as the number of people that are uh, acting and behaving like you in this um, uh, anonymity network. So the author encourages us through a thought experiment to consider something uh, of the sort. Imagine you have uh, an email you want to send and you have uh, uh, two options for email encryption. On your left is a little, a tiny padlock. It's a, a light crypto uh, security um, encryption scheme for your email. And on the right is a big lock. It's a heavy crypto um, uh, encryption scheme. So you have to ask yourself, am I going to use the heavy duty encryption or the lightweight encryption? Uh, the obvious thing is to say, oh, I'll just use the, the, the best possible encryption scheme uh, that there is out there. However, what this fails to consider is that email encryption isn't a one person endeavor. It's something you do with other participants. And other participants uh, might not use the same email encryption scheme that you use, but not just that, even if you do use a particular email encryption scheme, if they use the scheme you are using poorly, your privacy is hurt because uh, the, anonymity, uh, the anonymity network is weakened by bad participants who don't know what they're doing. Um, and if you are really super knowledgeable about uh, using email encryption, and there's only 10 other people in the whole world that are aware of this, then you have another problem, which is that are you really hidden in this network? 
So we're going to talk about some principles in anonymity network. So insecure, uh, so, so these are just some things that were brought up by uh, uh, the author. Insecure modes of operation are bound to be used unknowingly in those modes. So if you have some encryption scheme, some sort of privacy uh, scheme in an anonymity network, insecure modes of operation are a big red flag. Optional security typically uh, uh, get turned off and users forget to turn them back on uh, ever again. Uh, the example that's given here is um, browser cookies. So a lot of people click no when a site asks for cookies, but then later they'll click yes and they'll never go back to clicking no. So from then on, they're always giving their personal information to sites that they visit. Uh, badly labeled off switches is another uh, problem. Um, and this is uh, where uh, a user um, has the ability to turn off something that secures uh, their privacy and doesn't realize that they're they're really harming their privacy because they see a switch and it's not properly labeled as a dangerous off switch. So they, they trigger it and they don't realize that they've hurt their privacy. And what's worse is that someone could convince that user to do that um, as a social engineering attack. Uh, inconvenient security often ends up being tossed aside for more convenient but less secure methods of operation. Um, so people don't people don't want to behave in an inconvenient way, so they'll pick the more convenient way, which is uh, often hurts them. A uh, false sense of security is a big problem where a user wrongfully thinks that what they're doing is secure and private when what they're doing is not secure and private. Uh, and then bad mental models encourage users to behave in, uh, in, in the wrong way. Um, and don't accurately uh, allow the user to appreciate how private or secure uh, their behavior is. So usability is more important for privacy. Uh, this is the claim the author is making. So when more users join the network, existing users benefit. Uh, this is the case with every anonymity network uh, that, that we're talking about. Um, and encryption is different than anonymity. In an anonymity network, you can, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, with encryption, you can encrypt your own files on your own computer with any encryption scheme that you want. Um, you can pick the strongest encryption scheme, that's fine. But when you're in an anonymity network, you depend on your peers to be anonymous. So uh, when we talked, uh, so the example here is, is gonna be Tor, but I just wanna remind you that CoinShuffle used the same idea. Uh, and we'll, we'll just show the analogy. If you recall, uh, all these users have their outputs and they wanna do a coin join, but they have these equal outputs that must be anonymous. And so what they do is they uh, onion encrypt their outputs and then run them through a network of their peers. And the final result is a set of outputs that no one knows where the outputs came from. Only orange knows his, his or her own output and yellow knows his or her own output, but yellow doesn't know anyone else's output. So everyone is anonymous against everyone else and no one knows anyone else's outputs. Uh, and Tor is the, you know, exactly the same idea. In this case, the peers are Tor nodes. Um, and here red wants to send a packet maybe to a website, um, you know, uh, uh, ping a website. And so uh, he or she onion encrypts uh, through the network, you know, at each layer, uh, the, the, at each step, one layer is removed and sent across. And at any point, you know, someone like green has no idea that this has come from red. Um, at each point, it's just one person passing to the next until finally uh, purple will reach out to the, to the website on behalf of red without even uh, knowledge that, that red is the person that <clears throat> sent the information. Um, so Tor is an anonymity network. Uh, if, if you can't break the encryption of Tor, which, which we assume you can't, then really what it looks like is just this big black box where users are you know, entering the network and they're doing all sorts of activity and all you see is activity coming in and coming out, but you don't know how to connect which person to which other person. Um, and so the first problem is that if only one person is using Tor, it's trivial to see, uh, to, to link um, uh, information going out of, to, uh, out of the Tor network and information coming into the Tor network. Um, another problem is that if everyone is speaking English and doing things in a very Western English way, so for example, uh, you know, 
you know, writing in English, accessing English websites, uh, maybe only uh, awake at certain times of the day. Then someone here, for example, who's Hungarian and, and, and speaking in Hungarian will be easily um, um, and, and, um, de-anonymized by the fact that they're the only person that, that's doing that. So usability versus security is a, a big problem. Um, and you have to ask, uh, you know, which are you going to pick? Are you going to pick the slow, high latency system or the fast, low latency system? Which are you going to pick? Well, supposing that the high latency, slow system is way, way better, but nobody is using it. It ends up being the case that even though you know it's more secure, it's better to use the faster network where more people are currently using it. Um, and a, a, a big thing that the uh, the author now uh, claims is that uh, this, they are against. This is for the, Max. This 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 section is for Max. <laughs> yes. So uh, I'm gonna really hold it in. Uh, and not say anything about wasabi, <laughs> even though <laughs> the tone of my voice should hint strongly that this is uh, talking about us. Um, but the author argues against options, right? So designers are faced with security decisions. They leave it to the user because designers don't necessarily know what the right thing to do. The protocol designers leave it to the implementers. The implementers leave it also to the users. And what ends up happening? Users are the least able to make decisions for themselves. So if you're asking a user, hey, you go ahead, you, you decide AES or TwoFish, which, which is your preferred symmetric encryption scheme. Unless you know what, a, what symmetric encryption schemes look like and you know the difference between those two uh, models, uh, you are not the right person to answer that question. Options make the code very hard to audit because the configuration of a particular software is exponentially grows uh, with the, with more um, uh, options that you give it. So if you give you know one option over here, option A, and one option over here, uh, option B, then whether or not option A is on or off, and whether or not option B is on or off, give you four options, and that you know this is clearly grows exponentially. Users with uncommon preferences are singled out. This is a very interesting one. So you give people tons of options. Now they select, you know, out of the 14 options you give them, they select seven of them. That is already way, very unlikely to match with someone else. And the default option usually prevails for casual users. And so it should prevail for experienced users as well. This is a pretty big um, argument, I think, that's being made by the author. But I think it's, it's very convincing. Um, so one case study was uh, the Mixed Minion and the MIME uh, case study. So Mixed Minion is an, uh, an email anonymity network and MIME is the multipurpose internet mail extension. It's just a flag that tells you the, 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 the format of the content of an email. Um, the problem is that every email service, service uses a d distinct MIME. And the, what that means is that if, uh, if two people are using one email service, uh, and everyone else uses a different one, you can clearly link those two email services to each other. So one, one thought you might have is, well, okay, why don't we just limit everyone who uses our mixed minion software to one format? Um, but the authors talk about how if you, if you limit it to one format, all of a sudden you don't let users send Word documents, you don't let users send PDF documents, you don't let users do all of these things. So what's gonna happen is the user is gonna figure out a way to overcome this problem by by making by doing the wrong thing essentially in terms of privacy and by hurting their privacy while thinking they're still doing good for their privacy, um, and further, um, uh, it, it it will end up being the case that users simply leave the protocol altogether because you didn't give them enough options. So in the end, uh, and I was surprised to read this, um, the the middle ground. The, the best case for privacy was to allow users to behave in, di in a diverse way, but warn them clearly about certain choices. Okay, Tor installation. Tor is once used by only cool nerds on Unix systems. Uh, and then as you, new users started to join and use Tor, there was a need to quickly onboard them without a lot of, a lot of uh, explanation. 
but beginners did not understand DNS issues. So what, what happened is they didn't realize that Tor wouldn't help at all if you are uh, um, pinging a, a website over the clearnet for a lookup table of the site that you're looking to access. Um, so you need a SOX5 proxy or w whatever it is, and, and beginners didn't understand this. Um, so what kind of solutions could, could, could we do for these, these users who essentially were getting no privacy by, by doing this? Well, okay, the first thing the first intuition was improved documentation. Turns out that didn't help. It only helped users who read it. And all the users that didn't re read it just continued to make, make big privacy blunders. The next thing was give a warning message. This only created more confusion. You know, you would say to them, hey, you're, you know, by, by using Tor without a SOX5 proxy, your DNS is leaked to the blah, blah. The user would just be completely confused about what was going on. Finally, the, the working solution was an error message that pointed to the documentation, which told the user what to do. Okay. Um, so this is where I ran out of time because uh, I'm a busy man, but I take responsibility. So we'll, we'll continue talking about the paper, but I don't have any more slides. Um, so we'll just leave it to discussion. <clears throat> Thank you, Aviv. I think this paper was very different from the previous sessions because, I mean, it, it was very unique in a sense that it was kind of a philosophical paper, but in a research paper, a philosophical piece in a research paper. So with that said, that's why I don't have much comments on it. <laughs> but uh, I have something. I, I have one, two, three, four, five questions for the author who is not with us. But I have three more topics to discuss. And, and this might be a bit redundant because of we've talked about it. But let's, let's see. The very first thing I just... I just want to, I just want to to quote something that another area where human factors are critical in privacy is bootstrapping new systems, and this resonates with me a lot because in Wasabi, uh, how do you bootstrap this thing was quite a huge issue back then, but it it somehow all worked out. Yeah. What, what, what do you guys have? Yeah, I, I remember the early days where we had the anonymity set of five for Wasabi mixes. Uh, and of course, it did not give you much privacy at all. Uh, but still, uh, you know, enthusiasts could use it knowing that they did not get much privacy, um, but, but knowing the potential that it has, right? And uh, that it's at least, you know, better than nothing, uh, even if you do small rounds. Uh, it's, it's still better than nothing uh, than not doing CoinJoin at all. Uh, so, so that was the reason why I used it, right? First, it, it's, it was the only workable solution. Um, so there was no other option uh, for me as an enthusiast. And second, uh, I, 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 I saw the potential of what this can be and that if I help bootstrap the system now, that later at a point in time, when others start using this, uh, you know, I, I can have a better tool. Yeah, I remember uh, finding out about Wasabi maybe because of Max's uh, videos and all of his enthusiasm about Wasabi Wallet. And that kind of like drove me into looking it up. And yeah, I was definitely uh, gladly surprised that it wasn't that difficult that I first thought. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of confusing little words uh, words that people use when talking about Wasabi Wallet and the coin joins in itself. So I think that's uh, a big issue that uh, it might scare people off just because they don't know what to expect. It's interesting, isn't it? We have a philosophical paper and because of the lack of of technical depth in it, but but it's 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 very good, huge uh, big picture document. But because of the lack of technical depth, we are all defaulting <laughs> onto applying it to 
to the best known system that we know about, which is Wasabi. <laughs> so maybe this conversation is going to be about Wasabi. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, I think that um, we, we should talk about Wasabi because there's no way to... It, it's, it's just a good way to, to uh, nest this conversation into something that we can all understand really well. So l- l- let me start by saying this. Um, this paper, uh, it made me feel like I, like I was right about something and, and wrong about something from the past. So one thing I was right about, or at least this, this paper argues that I was right about, is the idea that if we can, we should make the way that Wasabi works very, very simple to the point where, um, you know, uh, to explain to a user what they're going to expect out of, out of Wasabi, it should be it should be very simple and it should stay constant and, and the same. Um, so it, it seems like this paper would argue f- for that. Um, where I was wrong is, is the idea of giving people a lot of options. Um, so allowing people, you know, for example, I was very happy with the custom fee um, and I wasn't happy before that when there wasn't a custom fee. But having read this paper, I actually am of the belief that there should only be three options for, for a fee. And if we really care about what we're doing, we should accept the fact that even though you don't get your perfect, exact, correct fee that you think is right, it's still better for everyone else. Um, and I think that's something we should we should do a- a- across the board for all features. You know, Aviv, it's uh, great that you bring it up because that was exactly what came to my mind too, the issue of the fee. I personally love setting uh, custom fees exactly how I like it. But after reading this paper, that's very stupid to do. You know, you should just go with Bitcoin Core smart fee estimation uh, and, and do the default that everyone else uses. That, that leads to much less solid uh, fingerprinting. Um, um, but, but, you know, it also comes with the other point in the paper uh, that al- although having too many options is an issue, if you don't have many options, then people will not use it. Right. A power user who, who insists on having the custom fees. He will, he will, you know, then no longer use Wasabi, thus decreasing the network effect. Uh, so I think what we have right now is a decent compromise where, uh, you know, at least the average user has only the fee slider with Bitcoin Core estimation. But then in these settings, an advanced user can activate the custom fee and do what he wants. Right. So, so I think that is good, but I would now much, much more go into that direction where I would suggest to every user to always go with Bitcoin Core. Uh, unless it is it is some case where it really uh, is, is necessary. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I, what I really liked was um, was the idea of having error messages point to documentation, because I know we have excellent documentation and we're very proud of it. But right now, the problem is that most users don't read it, and the biggest plus that I, I see from the documentation is that Yahya is really good at referencing documentation when answering questions to people on, on Reddit. Um, so he, he's doing exactly what the paper recommends, which is when someone asks a question, you just point exactly in the documentation where it is. But if we could have altering settings, po- like with an error message that points to documentation. So, you know, if I turn off Tor, um, it should say error, you've, you're, you've turned off Tor. Here's the documentation where it explains why Tor protects your privacy. We should somehow be, yeah, I've been thinking about this too, because there, there is a wallet. I think it's called Exodus. And people were saying very good things about it, that it, it has the documentation in the wallet itself. And that gives them a lot of confidence and, I was thinking about it, it a lot too, but but how do you, you know, how do you solve this technical challenge in a different way? Because the obvious way is to to add the documentation into Wasabi and and it's kind of like du- duplicating everything. But how do you solve it without duplicating? That's a good question. Or is the is the system stable enough so we could have sufficient documentations or is the system is is going to change that much that 
it just doesn't work um, building the documentation into Wasabi, you know? I think documentation in Wasabi is exactly right. One thing I thought about reading this paper is about mental models. And to me, it's like every time I, sh I open Wasabi, it should have 10 like, or, or five screens, beautiful graphic screens, like 6102 Bitcoin uh, with his graphic designs um, that I can skip if I want to, like a big skip button right below. But every time you go into Wasabi, it should just be like, hey, this is what you're doing. This is what it looks like. This is, you know, just some good mental models for users um, and having documentation and these mental models in, in Wasabi without them having to go to a website or Reddit or, or GitHub. I think that would be a, a pretty big plus. Yeah. I yes, I agree, so. Aviv, here. It's, it's, it's I think, a, a twofold approach, right? One is to have such a starting guide uh, to get every user on the, on the same, you know, on the same starting point. Uh, and, and that is definitely awesome. And then further, it would be for these advanced things, like at least as you mentioned, when you turn off Tor, right? Uh, these things where many edge cases, there are thousands of them in the wallet, right? Where then uh, one pop-up notification comes that says, this is wrong, danger, be careful. Here is explained why, right? Uh, so I think a combination of both uh, is, is what might be useful here. Yeah, I was not arguing against documentation in, in the wallet. I'm just bringing up that there are other issues here, which is the technical debt, that every single feature has to be created in with, with the documentation itself. And if you want to change something, then you have to update the documentation. So it's like, it's like double work. And it, it might worth when, when the product doesn't really want to change that much anymore. Oh, it's like, uh, it's, it's like new languages. It's like having your software in many different languages is awesome, except that you won't be able to change it anymore. And without, without fixing every single language. Uh, you know, that's, that's the real issue here. I mean, software once is, is soft, right? Hardware is hard. It doesn't change. Software is soft. It, it always changes. Anyway, uh, any more on this? You know, uh, I think one, especially regarding options, uh, that is very applicable to Wasabi uh, is the question of manual or automatic coin selection, right? Of course, it's, in, in my opinion, one of the best features of Wasabi to have the manual coin selection, uh, because this allows users who know what they're doing to, uh, to use this to a great extent. But of course, this also means that anyone who does not know what they're doing, which is the vast majority of all users, to shoot themselves in the foot and to fuck up. Right. Um, so, so where, where, where do we stand here? Um, can we, or like, do we even have the technical capacity to having a sane automatic coin selection algorithm that actually works um, for for anyone? Right. Yes, I think it's already possible, uh, but uh, it's a lot of work and thinking. And how do you do the labels? But um, maybe a. That's definitely the goal, right? To get rid of the coins, but it's not going to happen within five to ten years, maybe, <laughs> because it's just so ingrained. But but on the other hand, moving into the direction of of automatic coin selection by grouping coins, uh, it's it's like semi-automatic. That that would that would make sense more sense than just getting rid of the coins altogether. Rather, just move slowly into that direction. Like all the the red, all the green coins, and there isn't really much of a difference between them, so they could be grouped into one row, for example. Uh, actually, I, I would point out that there is a difference between green coins if they're they come from two separate. Um, instances of mixing. As an example, if I mix some coins two weeks ago and I mix some coins yesterday, um, those green coins are coming from different times. So an optimal coin selection would actually pick coins from across both 
um, because that would really be confusing to in terms of linking um, which which user does. I mean, maybe not, um, but they're 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 not exactly the same. Yes, they are not exactly the same, but for all intents and purposes, for for all the threat models, they could be considered the same. Yes, again, right, and uh, and the issue that comes up here is that as long as we rely on manual coin selection, we again have user bias on on which option is is being chosen. Right? And and that can lead to, to to again fingerprinting of individual users depending on how they select the coins. Right? So so th this is indeed a very very pressing uh, issue. I and don't agree with that until you give me an example. Hmm. Let me think. Well. Specifically for coin selection. You're talking about manual coin selection now. Yes. Yeah, right. Users are. You I, know, for example, what, what 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 Avi said that if you, if you have two different um, you know clusters of mixed coins, right? They're mixed, but they're still from different uh, sessions of mixing. Uh, now, if one user all the time selects for one transaction only those coins within one session, and another user selects coins from that that span across sessions, uh, you know that that might already be be some some uh, threat model. User doesn't even know that there are sessions. I, even I'm not sure what sessions mean in this context. Different rounds, maybe. But but. As far as I understood, we went down on that thought rabbit hole and then ended up nowhere because it did not really, really made that much sense. Is that correct uh, assertion of the situation? Sorry, uh, I went down which rabbit hole? This, these two sessions coins thing. Um, you mean having coin selections from two different sessions? Yes. Yeah. I, so the, I, um, the reason why I think it would make some sense is because, you know, if you have, if you receive, let's just, simple example, you received one Bitcoin twice. So once a month ago, once a week ago. And you have 10 coins from both. If you if you need to send someone one Bitcoin, it would be better for you to send a few coins from the week ago and a few coins from the month ago. Um, Why? Because it... So generally, you don't want to send all the coins from a mix, right? You, you don't want to like if you if you if you mix coins and now you have twenty coins you don't want to send all of those twenty together. So uh, uh, how come? Because you you know you sort of you enter it at one point in the network, you exit it at another point, and the amounts are similar. So there's a higher degree of linkability. Um, so what happens is, is is if you point to two different times you entered, right? Now there's a, a I think this is kind okay, of okay. my intuition. Uh, I think the I, I, your intuition is right, which is that, uh, you know, if you are mixing one after another, then those coins might be more likely to to belong to the same cluster, right? This is your intuition and, 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 and this is somewhat right. What What you're missing there is that merging together coins actually exposes that link 100%. So it's you don't expose more than you already expose. You know what I mean? So the intuition well, is that... Coins ha, ha, sorry, M merging coins links 100%? Yeah, yeah. How is that? Uh, you 
put two coins into the same transaction, so that must come from the same person. Right. Okay. As blockchain analysis heuristics one on one. Okay. But, but blockchain no one analysis is ownership heuristic. That's that's what I'm talking about. Okay, but but so but blockchain analysis will will look at those uh, those two coins and say, okay, one coin is from a week ago, one coin is from a month ago. Now we need to find a user that used Wasabi a month ago and a week ago. And, th and that could be any user, like th there's a lot of users there. Um, and they, 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 they don't have a good upper bound because the user only selected one coin from each instead of two coins from the same place. Oh, why would I? I okay, <laughs> I, 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 I don't. So, if, so, so in my in, 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 in my example um, of a person who received one coin, one Bitcoin a month ago, one Bitcoin a week ago, he has twenty coins in total, right? Uh, ten from a week ago, ten from a month ago. And I'm saying if you want to send someone one Bitcoin, it's better that you send five coins from a week ago and five coins from a month ago than 10 coins from a week ago. Right? Because uh, five coins from a week ago, there's a lot of people that that mixed and had five coins from a week ago. Um, and five coins from a month ago, there's a lot of people that had five coins from from a month ago so um that th that that's where my intuition comes from as opposed to 10 coins which is which is now reduction you, you know Aviv, that, that intuition might be right but i would say it depends very much on the other users right uh, to, to quoting here the paper chapter 10 users safety relies on them behaving like the others users but how can they predict how other users behave Right? And, and that's exactly the issue. If there are, if there are more people who have 10 coins from this week compared to, um, users that have five coins from this week, five coins from last month, then it, it, you might actually be better to send the 10 coins from this week rather than the five and the five, right? Because there are more users who have 10 coins from this week. Uh, so, so although your intuition might be correct, it very much depends on other users. And how do we know how their coin situation is? We don't really. Okay, that, that's a good, that's a very good point. Um, yeah, yeah, that's I, a very good point. I don't also, I don't agree with that, Abhi, uh, with that insight, uh, because you are asking your another uh, 10 Bitcoin UTXO for no reason. I mean, I do kind of understand what you mean by that, uh, confusing the timing analysis and mixing up another UTXO from different time uh, or different rounds. But I don't know, you would have to go on and mix that uh, 10 Bitcoin uh, UTXO again anyway. So I'm not sure if that's the most convenient thing for uh, the user to do. I'm not sure, but my intuition would be uh, to disagree. <laughs> So regarding this paper, just uh, it's really, really instructive that uh, we're talking about these UTXO coin selections, those even if the intuition would be 100% correct, there is still the, the thing that we learned last week that it's kind of computationally infeasible to to look look at these links, especially if you are talking with probabilities, and and this brings back brings us back to the paper that is is this procrastination and the user experience shouldn't be more important than some some really weak intuition on privacy, you know. Yeah, and this is where I agree here uh, too, right? Of course, there, there might be, uh, you know, something to be figured out on how precisely to do this coin selection uh, and then how to do it right. But after all, I think the, the 
this is comparatively a marginal gain of privacy, right? To have some better private uh, time uh, correlation protection uh, or whatever. But comparing that to a user interface that is much more intuitive, where more users will use it, where the anonymity set as a whole grows, that will give, uh, I would say, much more privacy. Um, of course, it's a different strategy. I agree with Max, actually. I, I think there are way bigger problems and bigger gains we could make than coin selection. I was just thinking out loud, so I'm, I'm happy to concede that uh, the coin selection doesn't matter that much, or at least we, if we want, if we, we can think about this at another time. Okay, new topic I'm reading from the paper. Reputability is an anonymity issue for two reasons. First, it impacts the sustainability of the network. A network that's always about to be shut down has difficulty attracting and keeping users, so its anonymity set suffers. <clears throat> Second, a disreputable network attracts the attention of powerful attackers who may not mind revealing the identities of all of the users to uncover a few bad ones. Now, I was watching the Tor developers talk yesterday and he was talking about Silk Road. That when Silk Road was shut down, uh, I'm not sure which agency, um, but some, some American US agency went to him and told him that 90% of the Tor traffic just disappeared because Silk Road was shut down. And he was like, oh, really? Uh, and went home and, and, and looked at the stuff that was, was going on. And it turned out that that was a lie. So that's why transparency is kind of important in anonymity systems because adversaries just say any statistics that they come up with out of nowhere and just just makes make false accusations so reputability what's your thought on that yes i think that's that's quite a good insight right because again um the, the reputation will lead users to trust or not trust uh, the software uh, with their privacy and then of course the more the more users trust a specific software or tool in general with uh, to be used to protect their privacy the higher the anonymity set thus the higher the privacy and so if you have some shady provider uh, you know claiming that he gives privacy but but uh, no, nobody really believing him then of course nobody will use him and thus there will actually not be any privacy compared to if you have a, a provider that is very transparent and very open and very educative uh, then this this will lead more users uh, to uh, to trust that this is a, the the right tool to use, and thus providing a higher anonymity set. All right. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, sorry. A, a big thing with the paper that I took away is how important it is to help the least knowledgeable users. You know um, how critical they are. And because if you think of a lot of people that come into the Bitcoin space and that are, you know, not super tech oriented, don't know, don't know a lot, a, a, a lot of those people are, are not mal malicious or nefarious. So if they decide not to use Wasabi, then Wasabi is only used by two groups, criminals and people who are smart and, and appreciate privacy and, and have the ability to do that. But, but we have to have you know, everyday people who don't even know very much apart from that it's secure and private who, who are using it without without flaw. Yeah, very much agreed. And, and that was, uh, funnily enough, my main motivation of doing the educational videos at first because I realized that the tool is shit if only five people use it. <laughs> so if I want privacy myself, I better educate others how to use it. All right, so the very last topic I have for today, and I'm going to just, just give this question out and let you guys think about it. And um, I, I'm not sure I'm going to contribute much for the conversation from here on. Just wait for some awkward moment and, and then discuss the next, next uh, meetings. Um, uh, schedule of what what we should do. So, 
after reading this paper, how should I put it? You know, this paper is about usability, more important than, than technical hardness. And it's quite apparent that Wasabi was, from the very beginning, was going for anonymity, like in the hardest sense that could be humanly achieved on Bitcoin. And compare it to something like Dark Wallet. Yeah, probably Dark Wallet was the purest idea of usability there. That it, it was doing two of two coin joins. If you want to send money somewhere, then you register this send. And whenever there is another person who wants to send, you're going to send together. That, that was Dark Wallet. And maybe we are in the wrong path with Wasabi against trying to achieve ultimate privacy. But maybe just two of two coin joins would do much more for Bitcoin privacy than this. I think Adam, you're you're on on, on somewhat of a track here, um, but I think it can still be combined both. Right? If if you have only the dark wallet concept, very usable, but only two of two coin joins, then it, it, although it might provide a large anonymity set of a total number of users, well, for any given user, it does not provide much privacy at all. Right? Uh, so so of course, what I would like to have uh, is a bit of both. Right? To have fifty anonymity set coin joins that are very easy one-click function that just work. Right? Uh, so of course that would be perfect uh, to have a good pr ma mathematically sound privacy protocols that are very easy to use. I, I, I uh, stuck in the motion with Max. Uh, the paper even explicitly says if you use an insecure protocol, it doesn't matter how easy to use it is. It's not secure. Uh, it's not private. So uh, two of two coin join is, uh, is not a two-person coin join is not uh, is, is not secure. I, I would say five-person coin join is not secure. But then again, I get attacked on Twitter as Max did <laughs> earlier today. Um, yeah. So um, I, I, I want to bring up one point uh, that that shows how the Wasabi philosophy is slightly diverges from the philosophy of this paper, um, and that has to do with the fee that we charge for our users. So Wasabi uh, charges users based on the anonymity set. Um, this is a, an incredibly fair thing to do um, because it, it's proportional to how much privacy you are getting, right? You, you're paying proportional to how much privacy you're getting, uh, and that seems incredibly fair. So if, if you're getting not a lot of privacy, you're not, you're not paying as much. Um, but the result is twofold uh, uh, as a problem. The, the first problem is that users never know how much uh, uh, it costs. Um, and the second, quite ironically, quite funny, is that um, as soon as one person behaves poorly and gets de-anonymized, people will go on Twitter and say, oh, you charged for 80 anonymity set, but you're getting only 50. So you're being ripped off, um, which is something that we're not in control of. So I just want people, or I just want to hear you, thoughts um because i think that uh, paying per anonymity set is the correct pure way to do it but, uh, from a practical standpoint um uh, users simply don't know what's going on most users don't know what they're going to expect to pay and, and and are confused that is indeed a very good point of um that you bring up and maybe to put this a bit more into the light of uh, in context of the paper the paper describes these costs for privacy mainly in terms of latency, right? That that if you want to use uh, a, a more private system, you have to pay with your time, right? Uh, and uh, this this might also then come to, uh, to you know you can configure it. How long do you want to wait until Tor loads your website or whatever? Um, uh, and having a user option uh, to do so, right? How many hops do you want to have in the Onion Road? Uh, and of, of course, that on, on, on the other hand here is, is then what, what you bring up, right? that, that the, the more transparency you have uh, in that sense and the more easy it is to understand, uh, the better.
So I, I, did, I didn't want to talk too too much about uh, wasabi because I think that's a whole other um, conversation. But I would like to p push this as an idea. Would anybody be interested in having this discussion next week, sort of like a philosophical continuation? Or should this be much, much later once we've read many more papers? I would prefer it after... Uh, what is it? April 6th. That's a very specific day. <laughs> well, yes. Why? And you probably mean April 5th, uh, the conjoint day, which is the next Wasabi release. Yes, April 5th, because that's the conjoint day, that's the next Wasabi release, and whatever happens, then... After that, I'm going to 100% concentrate on research, and yeah, that's that's why. <laughs> so how often have I heard you say that you will concentrate on research now? <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm I'm coding a lot and trying to wrap up everything, but one of the things uh, with Bitcoin Core actually that it seems to Mm, there is some consensus needed for for something in Bitcoin Core in order to properly implement it to Wasabi, but the consensus is not reached. So it's like maybe maybe Bitcoin Core integration will be delayed to to, to uh, the further future than I hoped previously. So anyway. Um, any more more on this or should we discuss the next session's topics that what should it be i, uh, I still have quite a lot but rafael go ahead uh, yeah i just had uh, one thought about the uh, uh, topic about of uh, picking up uh, different coins for your transaction i mean if we are actually just trying to uh, confuse these uh, chain analytics uh, companies with de uh, doing like uh, mixing up with the heuristics and all of that stuff. I mean, why don't we just try to like, for example, the things like pay join where you are uh, making the uh, transaction look like uh, different than it actually is. Uh, it doesn't look like a normal payment. So why don't we just try to add these kind of options into the wallet or like not force the users to do a certain thing, but just give them a lot of tips and hints why this and that uh, way of doing stuff would be good for their anonymity. I, I don't know. So, I mean, that would just educate people already. Uh, so on that topic, um, this is what I was I was going to leave, leave out, but I'll just hint at it briefly. Um, by having users be able to consolidate and spend and coin join in the same transaction, uh, it, it makes things way easier for us from the perspective of uh, of hiding from forensics. Because now Wasabi is is just uh, all users are. Are, are doing actions only inside these massive coin joint transactions as opposed to doing actions on their own terms, uh, sending, sending funds outside of those transactions. Um, so that, that, that would be like revolutionary, like a, a gigantic leap forward in terms of privacy. Absolutely, I agree. Uh, you know, for, for the next um, conjoint implementation, I would just love uh, to have users being able to register multiple inputs to generate multiple outputs uh, and to be able to send precise amount to an external wallet address. Uh, that, that would that would be, I think, the win for, for Bitcoin privacy. Uh, so we just need to figure it out. <laughs> I, th I, think, I think this is a, a longer discussion, but uh, okay, go ahead, Rafa. Uh, yeah, sorry. I, I was just going to say that definitely that what Max said that uh, you could just add multiple inputs and get some multiple outputs, whatever you want. Uh, that would be pretty great. I mean, that would mix up a lot of different heuristics, wouldn't it? I mean, even as, as simple as being able to to take your mixed coins and pay someone in a Wasabi coin join. It would change everything because it means that anyone who receives funds 
anyone who spends a Wasabi coin joint output doesn't necessarily mean that they've ever used Wasabi. And that's what, that's what would really uh, change the game in terms of privacy. So I could literally coin join into my exchange address and that exchange now looks like it's doing coin joins, even though it's not. Um, so it's, it, so then it becomes hard to blame someone for uh, having a Wasabi coin join output. Yeah, I, I do like that idea, but I just think that that might give a little bit of uh, problems for the whoever receives the coins, you know, if they are not uh, aware of these being coin joint coins and if there is someone uh, like flagging them. I'm not sure, but I mean, I like the idea, but just we should all, uh, also think about the probable uh, problems that comes with that. I mean, for example, if you are sending to an exchange uh, through that coin join, uh, they could just freeze your funds. Or if you are sending to someone else and they don't, they are not actually knowing it's going to be from a coin join, they might get their funds freezed. I don't know. Indeed, but there's, there, there are many things uh, to take care of here. Um, one thing that I would like to talk about is Chapter 6, uh, but basically it's just the title of it, uh, which is yes. a Tor installation. Uh, and I think uh, th that is one of the aspects where Wasabi is absolutely superb, where it combines both being technically sound, right, having multiple Tor identities, different Tor circuits that change like every couple seconds with new circuits, while still being incredibly user-friendly in the sense that there is nothing in the GUI that the user has to set up, right? It just works plug and play by default for every user the same. There's nothing to configure, there's nothing to fuck up, you just start Wasabi and it works. And it works on a technologically very sound level. So I think this is the prime example of where we want to be with everything in the wallet. I'd have everything as technologically sound and as user-friendly, meaning no configuration at all, as the Tor set up in Wasabi. That's the best said. Okay, but, but yeah, not, not, not much to that. And then um, the second thing I would like to talk about still uh, is Chapter 7 um, about uh, the Java Anon proxy. Um, and what I found very interesting that it is a graphical user interface uh, that has three different anonymity levels. Low, which is red, fair, which is green, and high, which is blue. Uh, so these I've, I found very similar to the Wasabi Wallet anonymity set shields. Right, The red uh, cross shield, the yellow exclamation shield, the green shield, and the green checkmark shield. Right, to indicate how much anonymity set you have. Of course, uh, the, the more greener, the better, basically. And um, the, the second part of the comparison. Is, uh, just, just, just as a, there is also another one that's over 9,000, which is super <laughs> science. So that's the best. Don't tell them about it. Don't tell them. Nobody that's a secret. discovered it yet. <laughs> it's there for like half a year, a year now. <laughs> yeah. uh, but but uh, another comparison to this um, JAP that I found so interesting is that their level of anonymity depends on the number of users. So the more users use these same entry and exit nodes or whatever they're called, uh, the higher the anonymity, so they think. Right? And that is the same as we have in Wasabi, that the more users register their coins and the more quantity of equal value outputs being created, the higher the anonymity. Right? Which in, in, at first glance makes a lot of sense, right? The crowd is larger. But then what they talk about here in this chapter of CHOP is that it's still if you do, for example, in this case, time correlation, uh, you can still discover the user, right? Um, and in the sense of Wasabi, well, a bit, bit different, but if other users fuck up, or if, for example, you send to your own, to the same address twice, right? Address reuse, or you leak your XPUB, or whatever happens, there are still many ways that despite having a large crowd, you, that can still lead to de-anonymization. And I'm, I'm not sure if, if there's any way to, to, to remedy that, that regardless the size of the crowd and regardless how beautifully you display that in the GUI, there are still ways to fuck it up. And the user oftentimes not even, does not even know that he's fucking up his privacy. 
I mean, it, in Wasabi, we are low-balling it a lot. I mean, these adding together anonymity sets, because we, that's what we are doing, it's, it's just so incorrect. Uh, it's Mathematically speaking, we should be multiplying the anonymity sets, but we want to lowball it as much as possible, so we are not multiplying them. But adding them together, I don't know. So it's like, yeah, you can fuck up things, but on the other hand, we are trying to balance it out in, in some some way, even if that's kind of incorrect and misleading because you gain more privacy than actually it shows. But you know what I mean. It's, is that uh, correct, or what? What does the paper says about this approach? Well, well, basically, that it's very difficult, right? That that in in the case of Trump, uh, the the size of the crowd does not matter if you can do time correlation attacks, right? Something similar would be in Wasabi. The size of the anonymity set does not matter if you do address reuse afterwards, right? If you shoot yourself in the foot, then there's then you're screwed. Um, and you know, to, to a lesser extent, also if others shoot themselves in the foot, uh, then your anonymity size decreases uh, more and more uh, to a point where you might not even know that you no longer have any anonymity set because all other users are de-anonymized already. Well, if you mix a couple of times, then. Even if you don't mix a couple of times, only once, what are the chances that most of the other users are going to de-anonymize yourself, de-anonymize themselves? Uh. I don't know, but that's why I uh, recommend people to mix twice, just in case. Yeah. I mean, I know it's pretty low, but anyway. Yeah, and that's the... That's the other idea between mix twice and from and and apart in in time. So mix once now and mix once a year from now, and then you can you can be sure that the anonymity set is like really like multiplying or something like that. Uh, uh, yeah, th th that's a big uh, dis argument that uh, uh, Nopar and I have had because I'm of the firm belief that when you have a coin from a coin join and then you remix it in the immediate next coin join, it's barely even feasible to call that addition of anonymity set. Um, it, it, but, but okay, you can say that it's the addition of the anonymity set. You will have participants that are re re repeated, quite a few that are repeated from one to the, to the next. Um, but as soon as you remix from a coin join a month ago to a coin join today, uh, and everyone starts doing that, then you can actually make a, a pretty solid argument for multiplication or something that's even greater than addition. It might not be multiplication, but it but it, it, it could it's definitely more than addition. But you can make the argument what the paper says that that's just not usable. <laughs> if you have to wait months before you can use your coins, you know it no, all it would require is uh, when a user receives money, they mix, and then before they want to spend their money, they they mix or they mix spend something of that nature. Okay, um, okay, that's a good idea, actually. Yeah, you know, basically, it's the idea that, um, and again, to automate it, right? As soon as you receive it, immediately afterwards, it registers for a coin join, and then the only way to spend is in a coin join. Even if it's a naive, unequal amount coin join, it doesn't matter. Even if it's only a five par five person coin join, it doesn't really matter, right? Um, anything is better than having a two input, two output transaction, for example, just a, like the, the regular spending transaction. All right. Are we ready to decide on the next week's topic? 
Uh, one more thing that I would like to bring up now in the context that we talk about the, the anonymity set targets and bringing it back to the conversation about uh, against options, chapter four. Um, currently, we have uh, three different options that the user can choose. Yellow shield, green shield, and exclamation point shield. Um, is that is that too many choices, or, or or should the user even have a choice for how much anonymity set he should get? Um, because again, some users might just choose one round, some users might increase that to whatever they want. Uh, would it be better to have the same level of anonymity set target for every user and not even be able to configure it? Hmm. I, I don't know. I mean, once the feature is added, you cannot take it out. That's, that's something I know. Unless you have a very good alternative, of course. Well, I mean, but, but let's argue from the case that we are redesigning Wasabi with a new conjoin and a new UX. Hmm. I would still odd or, mm, okay. So it's a tricky question. I don't really know the answer to that. What would you guys do? I would get rid of the term anonymity set entirely, get rid of the option and then just have a, 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 a system that's, that's the lowest common denominator understand something like you you have to mix once and you have to mix once before you send um i don't know i mean in my opinion we are thinking uh, talking about a little bit way too small specifics and i don't think they are even that big of a deal i mean for example just indicating that you can mix for example just uh, seven different uh, or port, uh, put seven different outputs in a coin join. Uh, that's much more relevant uh, problem than uh, what's the color of the shields or the anonymity set number. I mean, I think those are awesome information. I think those are pretty relevant. I don't think those are anyway like disturbing or uh, confusing for new users. I think they are pretty great, but there's a lot of these different things that are a bit confusing. You know, there, there, are many, there are many quirks in the design that the, that really should be you know, redone uh, or just to make it more beautiful in general. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I just like the current version uh, way too much and I'm like, that. don't don't you guys <laughs> mess it up too much. <laughs> yeah, me too, me too. Uh, but one other thing to consider, again, is the point that Especially now, where the user pays for uh, or pays per anonymity set, right? it's it's a question of of how much is the user willing to pay, right? uh, and of course with with network level an uh, anonymity, he just pays with his time or with his computational power. But for Bitcoin anonymity, he pays for with, with his money, right? So so that is something to consider as well. There might be users who have uh, you know a, a high threshold for spending as much as possible on privacy because they really desperately need it. In quotations, again, uh, th that might lead to actually them being de-anonymized. But if it's clear that this one user paid a lot, then he might be tracked and, and that might be a fingerprint. Um, and on the other hand, other users just want to have very light uh, preliminary privacy and they don't want to pay as much. Right? And, and again, to get these two things uh, together is again options and, and configurations uh, and, and trying to reduce the footprint. Uh, it's, it's very difficult. There is something oh, I have to consider. Because of the virus, we might have to cut our beards down to make it not airtight. Anyway, so guys, uh, what do you think <laughs> about what do you think about uh, me? If I'm not, if I have time, then I would cut out the wasabi conversations from this and 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 let I don't know. Just, just cut out leave all no. the presentations. No. <laughs> yeah, but, one more. Uh, but Max, uh, aren't you worried that our dozens of viewers are going to be overwhelmed? There's like you two mean, dozen you mean, of them. you mean literally one dozen? 
Do you know when I walk the streets now, Max, I keep getting accosted by people who recognize me from YouTube. It's like I can't deal with this fame. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, I do have to go pretty soon. So, uh, Nopara, do you want to uh, decide uh, the paper or yes. suggest a paper? Do you have, do you have any um, suggestions? May I just ask one, uh, add one more thing uh, about this wallet discussion? Maybe just uh, adding something like uh, the total percentage of, uh, or at least the estimation about with the current uh, amount of participant in the next coin join uh, times the actual fee that goes to the coordinator and possibly like the actual network fee also, but just give us some kind of estimate for the user. I think that would be pretty awesome. So, because in my opinion, there's a lot of these questions about how much is this actually going to pay and people like calculating it and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm not quite sure where to put it. Obviously, I cannot crowd more things into the coin join tab because it's already scary. But this should be there. I don't know how. I'll take a look on it and just <laughs> give some kind of idea. Uh, anyway, Aviv, do you have any suggestion for, for the paper next week? Nope. Okay, so here are the things. Heuristics on Bitcoin Privacy Wiki, CoinJoin Sudoku, Boetsman, papers from blockchain analysis companies, Topological analysis of the Lightning Network, why I'm not an anthropist, block size design and application of blockchain analysis platform, traceability analysis on Monero, uh, towards information, theoretic metric for anonymity, a brief history of linear and mixed integer programming computation. Okay, so I'm not going to, 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 to talk about the, to, to say these, these papers again, just say what, what you think uh, would be interesting and we will vote on them. Right. I think last time also we, we said that it would be good to, to now, after this more philosophical paper, go into the calculation of the value of anonymity. Uh, so that will be CoinJoin Sudoku, that will be Boltzmann, uh, later why I'm not an anthropist. Uh, and I think that would be an interesting path to go down. How do we score the quality of a coin join? Say one paper. I think it would be good to start with Sudoku. Okay, coin join Sudoku. Who is voting for that? Yeah, I second the motion. Yeah, I like that too. Okay, I'm voting yeah. for that too. Oh, everyone is voting for that. Then I guess we just got a winner. So yay! Yay! <laughs> coin join Sudoku next week. All right. Uh, so, are you sure I shouldn't cut out the Wasabi stuff because it's it it should be about the paper? I mean, I don't know. It's not a big deal. It's like twenty people that are going to watch it, so not a big deal. And I, I think it was actually quite valuable to have this um, because I mean this was a rather philosophical one. Uh, so, it, yeah, I think it's good to apply this uh, more. Right. All right, then. Thank you, guys. And next week, coin join Sudoku, like, share, and subscribe, and research. So thank you. Bye-bye.